I'm Paul Dayball from Niagara College, and today I'm going to be doing a lecture on uh, different methods of printing. Um, you know, uh, in our lecture series, I've been going through, you know, how color works and, you know, resolution of images and stuff. But eventually, a lot of stuff still gets printed in the world. Um, we, get, we think of everything on a computer, but as you walk through life, um, everywhere you look, you see stuff printed. Um, so this is different uh, printing methods. All right. So let's uh, go through some of the different types. Um, so there's a laser printer, uh, which is, you know, what we use in the labs and lots of people have them. They're uh, by far the most efficient uh, of the printers as far as cost. Um, and um, you can, uh, so if you have this or you have an inkjet printer, this is a much cheaper uh, printing method, although you can't get all the color, but yeah, 90% of the time you only print in black and white anyway. So um, they, they are the best. And um, if you go to a photocopier, this is nothing more than a laser printer uh, hooked up to an image uh, into, um, let's say, a scanner or onto a network or something like that. That's all they really are. Uh, they used to be different. They used to be separate from laser printers, but now... This is just a laser printer connected to a scanner. All right. Uh, inkjet printing um, is uh, most common for most of you. Uh, lots of people have uh, inkjet printers in their house. And, uh, you, you know, they have the CMYK color model, um, which you would uh, have to... Um, you would have to go buy the little ink cartridges for and they are exorbitantly expensive crazy expensive um, Unless you get into the really large models um, where you're buying it in bulk, but uh, Anyways inkjet printers are really really effective. They produce really nice color um, So they're a pretty good method. So we're gonna go through that method also um, In silk screening we're gonna go through how silk screening works now silk screening uh, was an old process that's been used for a long, long time by artisans. Um, it was used extensively in the 50s, 60s, 70s for printing. Um, when we got to the late 80s, early 90s, uh, laser printers came along and inkjet printers came along. And by the 2000s, this had almost disappeared. But it was salvaged by the uh, young generation. Uh, and we'll talk about how what salvaged that. Okay. Um, this is the granddaddy of printing. These are uh, offset printing presses. I'll show you a video later on how a big, what's called a web press works. But uh, this is for uh, large industrial printing if you're going to print thousands of something. Or uh, you have to print something with a really special look to it. Then you would also use this. So let's talk about uh, laser printers and photocopiers first. And uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of um, how this works from a kind of a technical point of view. And then we're going to talk about when uh, to use this and what's the best way of using it. Okay. So um, a laser scanner, I'm going to do this and bring this over here. Um, a laser um, works this way. There's a thing called a, a corona wire and a discharge lamp. Now, the discharge lamp, this is all done with um, positive and negative electronic charges. So, um, if you can remember, um, there's positive charges and negative charges. And um, if you have a positive charge and negative charge, they attract each other. And if you have a negative charge and a negative charge, uh, they repel each other. So, if you think about it from a magnet point of view, because magnet and electricity kind of in the same realm. Um, if you have um, two magnets, and you probably did this in school, if you had North Pole and North Pole and you tried to put the magnets together, they would push apart. But if you had a North and a South Pole on a magnet, they would uh, zip together, right? So that's, you gotta keep that in your head for this, this to work. So think of magnet magnetism and electricity kind of together, right? It's the same kind of thing. So there's a, a laser here. Um, and this drum is turning and you've got to think about this laser moving across So think of it kind of like an old-fashioned typewriter So you're going across and you're pushing back and you're going across and you're pushing back and going across, right? So it writes across but in one line at a time and then it turns a little bit and then one line at a time So this drum is turning and that laser is going back and forth So if you think of this as a long tube, it's going back and forth across the tube the laser is turning on and off um, really, really quickly. So wherever it needs to have a an image on the drum, so wherever there's type or a picture, um, the laser is firing and it is putting a charge on the drum. Now, some of them are positive and negative, so we're going to do it one way. We're going to say that everywhere that an image is supposed to be, it would be a positive charge, okay? So here it would keep binking on and off and you would get a, a charge on the drum. 
Then it goes past the roller. So this is a positive charge. It goes past the developer, which is that kind of black toner, right? The developer roller is a black toner. It picks up black toner and it is a negative charge, negative charge. So since we have a positive charge in some areas here, and this is all negative, it attracts. And it sucks onto the drum right there. See how it's on the drum? It sucks onto the drum in the area that is required it puts the toner on the drum. Now the other parts of the drum have been given a strong negative charge. So no toner would go there because the toner is negative and the drum is negative. So no toner would go to the areas of the drum that have not been turned into a positive charge. So some areas of the drum attract the toner and some don't. So now it's on the on this drum uh, being attracted by uh, electronic electrical charges. It comes down here and a piece of paper comes through. Now, the toner on the uh, here has a, a positive charge still because it had a super positive charge up here and then it picked up some negative uh, stuff that got sucked onto it and it's still got a pretty big positive charge. The paper comes through and these two wires right here give the paper a super high negative charge, really high negative charge. And what it does is it then sucks the toner that's in the in the places where the image is from the drum onto the paper. So this toner gets sucked from by, by electronic charges from the drum onto the paper. So it is now on the paper, but it's not it's it's only on the paper by kind of like a static charge. Kind of the way cat hair attracts to any piece of uh, black uh, clothing that you own, right? It seems like black clothing has a charge that attracts all cat hair. Um, well, that's how it works at our house. So, and so it's now on there, but it's not permanently fused on there. It's just on by static charge. Then it rolls along here and it goes through this thing called the fuser roller. Now the fuser roller is a roller that's around 400 degrees because incidentally paper bursts into flame at 451 degrees. Hence the book, Fahrenheit 451. So at 451 degrees, paper will burst into flames. So this is at around 400 degrees so that uh, you don't get fires in your, in your laser printer. And then it rolls through those two rollers and it heats the paper and it fuses the toner. And the toner happens to be almost like a powdery plastic material. And it fuses it or burns it onto the paper. And that's why when the paper comes out of the laser printer, it's slightly warm. That's why it comes out slightly warm because it's um, it's gone through this 400 degrees. So why don't you burn your fingers? Well, paper is not really good at holding on to uh, onto heat or or attracting heat. It just, you know, it's not good heat conductor. So it doesn't hold on to the heat. By the time it comes out, it's slightly warm, but it's not 400 degrees anymore. It also was in there for a very short period of time. Um, and then as it comes out the other end, um, you got to remember, remember this paper had a high negative charge on it. So it's statically charged. So if, if you didn't do the next little step, you might get a little tiny bit of a spark when it comes out on your fingers. So at the end, if you'll notice on all laser printers, uh, when the paper comes out, it seems to go past a little brush. Um, and you would think maybe it's brushing off the toner, but really what it's doing is it's removing any excess static charge that's left on the paper. And that's what that's doing. It's kind of a grounding wire. So any negative charge that's left on the paper gets removed by those little... Um, little brushes that you see. So next time you're standing at a laser printer waiting for something to come out and you see something coming out, you'll see it going past little brushes that are there. And that's just removing any excess uh, charge. So there you go. You might want to go back and listen to that again or go look it up or something, but that's kind of how it works. Okay. It's uh, it's all done with electronic charges. Pretty complex for a little laser that you can buy for a couple hundred bucks, right? So when do you use this? And, and as we go through this lecture, you're going to see I use it. I, I talk about, um, you know, when to use it and cost effectiveness of using it. So here, this is a low to medium quality output. Uh, the output um, you would think is really super high quality and it looks really good and everything. But you got to remember, you're still working with a a, a, a hunk of toner, a bit of powder that you're sucking onto a drum and then pushing it onto the paper. And although it really is quite good nowadays, um, it's still low to medium quality. It's not it, it's not super, super high quality, but 
for 99% of us, it, you know, it looks really, really good. It's great, great output for the eyes that are looking at it. Um, the cost here is um, driven by the actual device and stuff. And here, the setup is minimal, like almost no setup is required. Well, basically, you hit the button and it comes out of the laser, right? So what kind of setup is there? There's no, you know, you don't have to go over and, you know, put toner on the drum or something. It's all just done for you. Um, so there's almost no setup cost. So the setup cost is like zero, right? You just hit the button and it comes out. Um, but... Um, it is slow, um, and it's best used for low volumes under 2,000. I say 2,000 because that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot of printing. But uh, got to remember um, that there are laser printers that are high-volume laser printers that run almost at the speed of small printing presses. They really, um, really, really, really go fast. So um, I would say under the volume of 2,000. You know, under that volume, you could probably get away with using a laser, and it might be cost-effective. It will only work with limited types of paper. If the paper has any uh, really rough surface on it, or if the paper is what's called a laid paper, where it's little, uh, you know, like, like a handmade paper or something like that, you can't really use it on a laser because... Um, it has to be so that it picks up the negative charge properly. It's got to be flat enough for the toner to lay perfectly on it, not have any areas that are going to be moved. Uh, and it's got to be able to go through that 400 degrees and fuse it on. So it's got to be paper that is designed for this to happen. And I'm not saying you can't have a lot of colors and stuff. You can get a lot of colors and beautiful looking paper. And you can get even what's called parchment papers that look like parchment that work in lasers. But when you go into a store, you want to make sure that it says it's laser ready or compatible with a laser photocopier or something like that. So um, you are kind of limited uh, to the papers um, that are available for lasers. There are a ton of them, not saying there's not, but it's just that some of the really um, high-end papers that look like, um, like they were hand done or something like that, you, you couldn't use those. The cost is a fixed price per unit, which means that if the first one comes out and it's five cents, if you print a thousand, the last one coming out is five cents. It's the same price. Um, so the the cost does not lower as the quantity grows. So as it, you print more, the cost doesn't go down. And the reason is there's no setup charge that um, gets charged over the number that you're doing. Okay, and, then, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, the, the cost is fixed per unit. Now, I do have to give you a word of warning about photocopiers. Now, if you have, if you work at a company that has a really large photocopier, example, Nagar College has really large photocopiers, they would be on a contract basis for service and sometimes even for the supplies. So um, when you print, um, if every time you do a page, um, whether you throw that page in the garbage or actually use it, uh, you, fa you paid a fee to the uh, photocopier company for the rental of the unit and for the servicing of the unit. So let's say it is, I don't know, 10 cents a printout or five cents a printout. If you have a really big company, it might be as low as five cents a printout. And that is paying, that five cents is to pay for service if it breaks down. So these are pretty complex devices, these really large photocopiers. And, and there is some, you know, some service work that has to be done and it would be pretty costly. So it's almost like an insurance policy, right? Breaks down, you paid five cents per click every time it comes out. And, uh, and that's how they get paid for. So um, be aware that if you're working in a company, you run out 100 and you throw it in the trash can, you, you didn't just pay for just the paper. The paper is probably the cheapest part of the whole thing, and the toner is not that expensive, but you did pay that click count. So be aware of that. You might want to actually, uh, if you're doing a lot of uh, uh, photocopying and printing and stuff at, at a company you're working at, uh, you might be, uh, be aware of that click count. You might want to ask about that. Also, look pretty good, right? Kind of know what a click count is. They're impressed that you actually thought about it. So you might want to do that, okay? So um, the as I said, the cost does not become lower as the quantity grows because there's that click count and there's uh, really no setup cost, okay? So still so screening. Um, this is a, a really interesting one because at first um, it was uh, just, just used uh, mainly for artists. 
really, you know, stuff by Picasso, all that kind of stuff was all, a lot of that was silk screened and lithography work and stuff like that. Um, the, but it, it's, it is a really interesting process and I'll, I'll try to show it to you the best I can here. All right, so let me stop here. Um, this material that you see right here is literally, um, originally it was a, a screen of silk, right? Of silk fabric. Uh, but now it's, you know, uh, plastic. Okay. So uh, it's think of it as the stuff that you put on screen doors, except a really fine version of that. So if you've seen the finest mesh on a screen door, that's what this would be like. Then they paint it with this material that you see here in green, this kind of a greenish material, um, which seals all the holes. And it is a special material because it's a, a material that is sensitive to light. So when you put it on, um, it's really kind of hard. It fills in all the holes on the screen. Then you put a negative over top of that and you expose it to a certain wavelength of light. So you have a special uh, fluorescent like light tube that you put over it and it uh, burns uh, through the negative. So the negative, um, wherever the negative is, it burns through the negative and it softens that material. So on the negative, the part that is exposed, like the part that you can see through on the negative, in other words, if you see negative of your bones, the part that shows your bones, um, that, that part, um, it, the light goes through and it softens the material so it can be washed away. So now you have parts of this material that are still hardened because they never saw the light. And then you have parts that are softened because they saw the, they, they went through and saw that light. Um, you wash that material with a special chemical and it washes away all of the material so that you have now holes in the, uh, in the uh, greenish material that are go right through the screen. So now you can push ink through those areas of the screen. So that's what he's doing here. He pushes it down onto the t-shirt and then he pushes the ink through those holes and you'll see that happening here. Now he's doing this in CMYK, of course. Um, it, uh, it is the printing process and this one happens to be um, uh, different colors. Like sometimes you can do it in CMYK or you can just do it in the colors that you want. Um, you could have portions in a deep blue and portions in a pink or something like that. So um, it, it can be CMYK or it could be just colors that they have selected. But you'll see them printing the dairy's colors and obviously the blue is here. He pushes that down and then he's squeegeeing the ink through the holes and voila, look at that, blue. Um, now he's going to go with a red. So obviously and now he's doing there is he's filled up the holes with red and now he's pushing them through. So when they pull back, they're pull it, pushing the ink through. And now he'll put a different screen. He moves a different screen into location. See now the yellow, he's going to push it into the hole. So he's filling up the holes and he's going to put it down on to the actual um, t-shirt and then push it onto the t-shirt. Oh, look at that. We're getting better. And, um, and now they're going to put the black on to really make it um, stand out so that the blacks are really black. And you've printed a t-shirt. Look at that. And you can see that uh, they never did print that purple, but they obviously mixed that purple out of the other colors, the green and the uh, blue and the, and the yellow. So, and then the black. There we go. There it is. Silk screening. Silk screening uh, can be done on a really large variety of materials. Almost anything that you can get flat. Anything you can get flat. And this is the reason silk screening has made a comeback is that um, the, the revolution of having graphic tees, like every store you go into sells a ton of graphic t-shirts. And, um, you know, wise buyers of a graphic t-shirt don't want the ones that feel rubbery uh, because they know that those are iron-on transfers and they rip off. And all of a sudden you end up with this thing that's got, you know, parts of it missing, right? What you really want is a silkscreen t-shirt where the ink goes right into the fibers and then as you wash it, it fades evenly, but it, it kind of looks cool as it fades. In fact, a lot of them are pre-faded when you get them to make it look that way. Um, but that's the cool thing about silk screening is that it actually goes into the fabric where an iron-on transfer is sitting on top of the fabric, almost glued onto the fabric. And it's a really noticeable difference even in the feel of the, of the product. Um, as you can see, you can do uh, all sorts of fabrics that can be made into other things, t-shirts. And then here's the other one where silk screening has become a big deal. 
um, is on DVDs and CDs. When uh, CDs first came out, um, we would use a paper label. But CDs don't spin very fast. Um, they really kind of go around slowly in comparison. Um, so if the label was slightly off center, it wouldn't create a huge wobble. But you know that if you have something that starts to spin faster and faster and faster, the faster it goes, the more noticeable the wobble is if it's not perfectly balanced. So by using a paper label, when they got to DVDs, um, the DVD was spinning a lot faster and uh, they would start to wobble in the machines because the paper labels weren't in the perfect location. So to solve that problem, what they had to do was they had to use silk screening. So in other words, print right on to the front of the, of the DVD or Blu-ray really, Blu really goes around fast. So that's what they started doing. So um, that's why you'll notice that almost all Blu-rays and all DVDs um, are, they don't have a paper label on them. They have no label on them. Uh, they are silk screened right onto the surface because of the speed at which they are turning around. And uh, all of a sudden, silk screening was back in style uh, between the uh, t-shirt and the uh, and the fabric and stuff. And I, and I often wonder whether Niagara College kind of regrets the day they closed out with silk screening for the art department because... Uh, it really is uh, used uh, quite often, but um, I'm sure they can teach it in other ways. Okay, so um, this can be done in a low to medium uh, quality. Uh, <laughs> how good of a quality can you get? You're pushing ink through a hole on a screen. Like, how good can it get, right? But um, it's pretty cool, and I, I think on, you know, since you're printing onto fabrics and stuff like that, um, I, I think you can get uh, a really great looking piece. We've all seen really great looking t-shirts and we've seen some great silk screen materials and stuff like that. Um, but it, as you, as you saw, um, the way it's done is pretty hand done. I mean, they've, I've tried to use machines and stuff, but in most of the world, um, silk screening is done by hand. Um, you know, they have people, four people standing around a machine, or usually five people, actually, um, four people doing the CMYK process of, of screening so one person does the blue one person does the yellow one person does the magenta one person does the black and then there's one person that takes the t-shirt off and puts the t-shirt on so it's a machine with five workstations and they just keep going around that's what they do all day is uh is silk screen so uh low to medium uh quality and uh, normally lower volumes but i say normally lower volumes you go into a store there is millions of graphic t-shirts so although we say uh, lower volume, nowadays, because of the, the want for graphic t-shirts, um, they are being done in huge volume in factories that are just pumping this stuff out. Um, the setup time can be really extensive. Um, obviously, right? You've got to make four screens. You've got to make the negatives. Like, so you got to get the artwork, get it into color separation, make the negatives, um, prepare the screen, burn the screen, wash the screen, put the screen onto the machine, uh, get all the ink ready. That is a lot of, of setup. Um, so the price lowers with the higher volume. So let's say you had a thousand dollars to get set up. Okay. And then you're going to print a thousand t-shirts. Well, then it's a dollar per t-shirt. But if you were only print 500 t-shirts instead of 1,000 t-shirts, that initial $1,000 setup is now $2 per t-shirt. Uh, and if you only printed 100 t-shirts, um, that $1,000 is now $10 per t-shirt. So you can see that the more you print, the lower the, the cost goes. And that's, um, you know, because if you have an extensive setup, um, you really want to do some higher volumes to make that work. But... You know, if you're uh, doing uh, 50 t-shirts from an artist's point of view, you're going to sell them for a good dollar. You know, you, it might be worth it to do that. You might have a, you know, $100 in cost to set that all up or something like that. So, um, you know, it, it all depends on whether you want to do it from artist point of view or you want to do it from a mo monetary volume point of view. Um, that's uh, the price per unit, though, on this one lowers with volume. Um, it's not used extensively for printed material anymore other than printing on fabrics. It really is used a lot for that. Um, at one time in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, they would actually do signs this way. You would see signs done through a silk skiing process. Um, and uh, the stop signs on the side of your road and all the signs on your roads right now are still done in silk screen. Um, but um, this really got taken over by um, large volume 
inkjet printers. So if you want to print a sign now or you want to print something, I don't know, some large poster or something like that, it used to be done, sometimes done by silk screen, sometimes done by hand, um, but it used to be done by silk screen. And now you would just put that on a large volume inkjet printer with a big size and you print the whole thing, right? So that's how that gets done now. Okay, inkjet printing, uh, the most common of the printing uh, that you use. Uh, most people have them. Um, and this is kind of how it works. When voltage is applied to a piezoelectric element, it contracts. A piezoelectric element and a vibration plate form a set. The contracting piezoelectric element moves the vibration plate to generate an inkjet mechanically with no need for heating. Each inkhead contains thousands of these sets, with each one firing precisely the right amount of ink at precisely the right place more than 40,000 times a second, achieving fine, high-quality printing. Epson's original, ever-evolving micro-piezo technology. With outstanding print quality and reliability, micro-piezo is utilized throughout the Epson printer range. For home, business, professional, production, and industrial use. Well, Pretty cool, right? Um, it's basically ink being uh, spurted onto a piece of paper. That's all it is. So uh, you think about it, if you were to have a whole bunch of really, 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 really tiny eyedroppers, um, and you had one with um, magenta, cyan, yellow, and black, four different eyedroppers, and you were able to drop them onto the page in the perfect positioning, you could form an image. That's basically how that works. Um, so now look over at your inkjet printer there and... Uh, and think, oh my God, that's really impressive. Like, how do you do that? Um, but that's how it works. Now, there is another type of one uh, that uses uh, wires. That's why he said without heating. Uh, there was one that would um, um, actually heat up a little wire and boil the ink, uh, basically boil the ink for a second, and then it would spurt out uh, one little drop of ink uh, from a boiling process. But that's kind of gone by the way, and the piezoelectric is, uh, is the way to go because... Uh, Piezo is just a material that when you give it a little bit of electricity, it um, bends. That's what it what it does. So, kind of cool. All right, so low volume. Why less than 100? Oh, my goodness. It takes forever to print these things out. You know that. Um, if you have an inkjet printer and you got to print uh, something of really high quality and you got to stand around and wait for it, it takes some time. Now, there are much faster ones out there that do really fast things, but you still are looking at something that is remind you reminds me of an old typewriter where the paper moves up one row and it goes across and moves up the next row and it goes across. Um, so it's a very slow process and that's why I say less than less than 100. You'd, you'd want to get to something else or go to a bigger printer or something, you know. Um, medium to high quality though, uh, incredible quality out of these things. If you um, use it on like a glossy paper or something like that, um, there is some super high quality printing can be done by these inkjet printers. I know um, um, I have an old uh, Epson um, 4000 in the Mac Lab, and and I use it uh, quite often. And, and even though it's very uh, old now, and it it still works great. You put the right paper on it, get the right ink in it, um, and it'll produce a really high quality image. So medium to high quality on this one. Minimum setup requirement. That's ah, like a laser printer, right? Um, although these things, uh, you have to kind of keep using them, or the ink starts to get sticky, and then you got some setup time because you got to clean up, clean it, but. Other than that, works pretty good. But they are more like a laser, right? You just hit the button and the paper starts coming out. You can use this on a huge variety of material. Uh, because you're spraying the ink on, um, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the laser printer um, where you get the, the high quality, um, but you also are spraying ink on so you can do what you can do with silk screening uh, where you're, you can spray it onto fabric. So... 
um, where uh, you can't put glossy paper through a laser printer, you can put it through here. You can use glossy paper, photo paper, uh, you can put uh, cardstock, like with a heavier paper, almost like a cardboard going through. Uh, yes, you can put through cloth and canvas. Uh, the, the old one in the Mac Lab uh, that we have, uh, the Epson 4000, you can get a roll of canvas and put it through there. You can also get paper um, that uh, is that non rippable rippable paper, you know, the stuff that you, it's really hard to rip, uh, so that you can do banners and then you can put in grommets uh, and hang the thing up like with, with over top of a street or outside or something like that. So uh, pretty amazing what you can do with it. They're, it's really impressive what you can print on. Um, it's used for most signs and banners nowadays. So if you drive through a town and you see a, a sign hanging over the street, you know, announcing some upcoming festival, that was more than likely done with an inkjet printer. Um, in fact, uh, one of the most interesting things I've seen lately on inkjet printers, and you'll see uh, really how large they can print, is that um, they are now printing the sides of buses and stuff with inkjet printers. So um, if you see um, a, a car in a car race, like a NASCAR race or any of those, um, you'll see all the stickers on the car and all the graphics on the car and everything. And that whole thing is done at one time. What they do is they print literally a plastic sticker and then they stick it to the side of the car. So they print the entire side of the car at one time and then they simply um, put it onto the side of the car. And that way uh, it's almost slipstream also, right? Like a very clear, you know, uh, it doesn't attract the wind or anything. Um, and that's uh, one of the cool things you're doing. But the sides of buses and all that kind of stuff, all being done now uh, with, uh, with inkjet printers. It's uh, the old-fashioned days of people standing there hand lettering onto something, all gone now. Offset printing is really the granddaddy of all printing. And um, it is... Uh, it came out in the um, early of, of the 1900s, um, probably in the 1940s, 1950s. That's when it really started to come along. Um, it was um, still uh, not being used everywhere in the 1970s. And in fact, the printing press at the St. Catherine Standard um, did not use this method, uh, the more modern method. They were using the old uh, letter press method where it was individual letters stamping onto paper. And they used that into the 80s. Um, so this method uh, was slow to come along because the equipment was so expensive to replace. Um, but now uh, every piece of printing, um, like books, magazines, anything you get printed, actual printed on printing press, uh, is done in offset printing method. So um, let me try to explain this uh, to you. Um, we talked uh, in lecture about um, the four different types of um, colors that go through a printing press, um, C, M, Y, and K. And I um, showed a um, I showed a piece that um, I color separated. So uh, if you kind of remember, there was a picture of a sunflowers and I color separated it into the different um, printings that would be required. And here's kind of it working. Uh, you can see at one end here, the cyan is being printed. Then the magenta is laid on. Um, and then the yellow is added. And as you can see, the image starts to come to life as you get to the, the, the first three colors. Um, and anywhere that you require a solid black, you would have to add the black at the end because these three colors, although they, they technically can make a black, like theoretically, I say, I'm sorry, theoretically can make a black, in real practice, uh, the black doesn't come out really super black and it comes out kind of a muddy gray or something like that. So uh, you want to re use real black at the end. Uh, but you can see it rolling through the printing press here. And... Um, and that's how uh, printing works. Um, it prints it one uh, dots almost on top of another in, in what's called a what's called a rosette pattern. Um, but they have to be printed in precise locations, and that is called printing in register. So precise locations for those. Okay. Video on how a printing press works. Again on a Friday night, and in about eight hours' time, you're going to be opening your weekend paper. But for now, this is what it looks like. We're at Transcontinental Printing in Vaughan, Ontario, to see the Globe and Mail go to press. I always tell all the folks that work for me, there's only two instant ways to get fired: run out of paper and run out of ink.
plate's aluminum. There's a coating on there so that it, the image can burn onto the plate. And so what this image is, is this image allows ink to adhere to where you see an image, and then that image is then offset back onto the paper when the paper runs through the unit. The pumps, which are behind these, pump the ink from here through those pipes out to the presses and down to the presses. Because we run a hybrid product here, which is running both cold set and heat set, we have to have two separate sets of ink. The heat set ink is actually a different type of ink that doesn't actually soak into the paper. It sits on top of the paper, and when it runs through the oven on the press, it, it solidifies the ink, whereas cold set ink actually soaks into the paper. And it's even more complicated because the heat set ink is actually run on a heavier stock. So if you look, the paper's even different. So it's a complicated process, but worth it, right? Absolutely. The first thing you notice when you walk in is the smell. It is overwhelming and powerful, and it's like a mixture of paper and hardware store smell is the only way that I can describe it. It's also very loud, which is why I'm wearing these. So this is a, we call the quiet room because it's relatively quiet compared to what it's like out there. But this is where the press operators actually run the press. When they're outside, all they're really doing is webbing up the press and hanging plates. Once that's completed, then they come in here and they run the show from inside the quiet room. How many times a night would you say generally you have to stop the presses to make a fix or change? Um, well, they probably have, they'll have at least one plate change, scheduled plate change every night. What does that mean when you have a scheduled plate change? They know that uh, we have to get the press started and get the papers put out the door to reach the further distance that the, the trucks have to go. But by doing that, they'll actually have to start without having some of the latest sports scores and such. So when the sports games are over, whether it's baseball, football, hockey, they'll stop the press We'll replate those pages and then we'll get back up and running. Um, depending on what news is taking place or what sports are going on, there could actually be two stops. Minutes do make a lot of difference. Just keep in mind the last file comes at 11 o'clock, but we still have to generate the plate and then the plate has to come and hang on the press and then the press has to start up and get good copy and the good copy has to go out to post press and they have to insert it into the machines out there and create the bundles down the conveyor and into the back of the truck. So there's where your 45 minute window is. From last file to first paper out. Okay, it is a really cool process, but I do want to go over one thing that he, he went over, but let me expand on how this actually works. The plate that you see here is an aluminum plate, and it has this stuff on it um, that um, gets, um, it, when it comes, it's solid green. The plate is solid green or solid blue. Sometimes they're blue. And when they use a, a laser, the laser um, uh, writes the image onto the plate. So it's a solid green plate, and the laser is going over it and writing the image. And where the laser wrote onto the plate, it hardens this material, and it kind of cures the material. Then it goes through a chemical bath, and it washes away all the stuff that didn't get cured. So on this printing plate, the green that's left over is where the laser wrote onto the plate. Um, and it does this in a really precise manner. I mean, the, the quality is really, really high. Um, so when they write the, the plate like this, now we have a printing plate that is aluminum. Now, if you've ever been outside in the winter or anywhere where there's aluminum, if it gets kind of damp, um, you can wipe an aluminum plate over and over and over, and it never seems to get dry. It just attracts water. Um, and in fact, if you leave an uh, aluminum out in any moisture, it'll become really wet really quickly. It, it attracts water. So anywhere on this plate that the aluminum is, it um, really becomes wet easily. The other parts, um, the parts that are green, the printed image part, um, it doesn't like water at all. It repels water. It really does. It repels water. Um, and it attracts um, like anything that's oily or um, greasy. So the aluminum plate has water, and you, we know that water and oil don't mix. So if you try to put ink on this plate, if you were to wipe, wipe ink over this plate, anywhere that was wet, so if you wetted the plate first, 
the wet would be on the aluminum part and uh, the parts that were were green would not be wet because they don't like water. And if you were to wipe ink over it at that point, the ink would attract to all the green spots, but it wouldn't go into the non-imaged um, spots because that has water. So what they do is they roll water over this plate first. It, the aluminum gets wet. And then the parts that aren't aluminum, the image portion, they don't get wet because they don't like water. And then when you roll ink past it, uh, ink only gets picked up onto the parts that are green, right? And the other parts that were wet would repel the ink off. And that's how they get ink into parts of the, some parts of the plate and ink not get ink into other parts of the plate. So it's all about water and oil don't mix. That's what it is. The aluminum parts repel the ink because they're wet. And the parts that are green or the image area parts, they pick up the ink because they attract ink and they don't like water. So that's how this works. And that's a basic element of, uh, of printing with a, uh, a printing plate. Um, you can have low quality or very high quality on this thing. So you can have a cheap little printing press and, you know, print out some uh, images that are um, okay. I mean, they look okay to you, but they're not really high quality. Or you can get on very expensive printing presses with very expensive papers and inks, and you can print some incredible high quality, like art magazine or art book quality material. So it's really impressive what you can do with it. It's useful for medium to high volumes, um, sometimes low volumes if required. So if I, I, I'm going to go back to, I'm sorry, um, used for medium to high volumes, sometimes low volumes if you require. Example, if you want to print something with fluorescent ink, it's probably best to do it on this type of printing press. Um, on normally ones that just do sheet one sheet of paper at a time um, or one cardboard at a time, if you want to do fluorescent inks or if you want to do... Uh, gold colored inks, actual inks that have gold fleck in them or colors that have actual pieces of silver in it. You would do that with with a printing press because you want the special quality. Uh, as you can see, pretty extensive setup. You got to make the plates, burn the eggs. It's kind of like silk screening, right? Lots of stuff to do before you get started. So um, there's lots of cost up front. The price per lowers per unit because of that thing of the setup time. If you have a hundred dollar setup and you run a hundred pieces, you're a dollar a piece. But if you run a thousand pieces, you're 10 cents a piece. It, you know, the, as the volume goes up, that cost of setup gets lowered over all of the pieces. Almost all paper types can be handled. Um, you can have glossy paper, bond paper, layered linen, because you're actually putting ink on it, right? So you could probably do anything. Um, linen is a paper. I'm sorry, I shouldn't think of it as linen fabric, uh, but you can have papers that are made out of linen and cotton and all sorts of stuff. You, you, when you feel them, they're like a very soft paper. Um, and you can do it in a variety of paper thicknesses. Um, so if you can get it to run through the printing press, you can pretty well print on it. That's that's the key. So you can print on uh, what's called cardstock, like a heavy, almost like a, a thin cardboard, that kind of stuff. So you can, you can print on a lot of stuff. It's really useful for all that. Um, the volume, um, the low volume when the quality requires. So if I was doing very, very special work, example, if I wanted, to, as I said, if I wanted to print gold flecked ink, onto this uh, special paper that looks like it was hand done or something like that for, let's say, um, special invitations for a large company or something, then we may only do 50 or 100, you know, and they're willing to pay that car cost. And I, I, I've always said, my favorite customer in the world is one that comes through the door and says to me, I don't care what it costs, just make it look great. We, we wish all of our customers came through the door that way. Most of them come through the door saying, I want it to look great and I got no money. I want it to look incredible, no money. That's not the greatest customer in the world. Okay. Um, the last uh, section here is about stuff you've got to think about, right? So if you look at all these pieces, it, look here, see all these things are have binding on them, these spiral binds, and they have holes punched in them, and they're cut special, and they've, you know, all sorts of weird things that have to happen. That has to happen after you print something. So if you print it, and then you got to put this spiral bind on it, well, that takes some time, right? And make these pads, you know, glue all the pads together and all that kind of stuff. That all costs. 
Sometimes it also costs you in that you screw it up and you got to go back and print more because you've screwed up the, the next portion of it. Um, so here is what my recommendation are for actually getting printing pricing and getting stuff printed. First of all, you got to figure out what the best printing method is. Think it through. If we got to print um, 1,500 of something, like 1,500 of you know a large size piece or something like that, well, you think, well, I could run that through the laser or the photocopier, but boy, the cost per click is expensive. You may want to go talk to somebody at a printing press. It might be a lot cheaper to do it on a printing press. Who knows, right? They don't have a per click count. So um, it might be cheaper. So you want to look around when you're, when you're considering printing. You want to think through this process. It's kind of important. Get a quote and get it in printing. Get it in print. I'm sorry. Get it in print. Get a quote. Get it in print really important um, so that everybody knows what everybody's doing, right? There's also some other costs that are you've got to think about. It's not just the printing cost. There's things called collating. That's putting pages together in the right order, right? So if I print page one, page two, page three, page four, and I print 100 of each of those, and I got to put them in the right order, page one, page two, page three, page four, I have to stand there and what's called collate them, put them in the proper order. Unless you use uh, like a photocopier, we'll do that for you. But if you do a printing press, well, they're printed separately. You got to do that. Um, stapling. Well, stapling is some kind called stitching um, on bigger things, but somebody has to stand there and do that. And But also on the other side, you can sometimes get a photocopier that will actually staple together things for you at the, at the end. Drilling is where you put the holes in something. So if I print a thousand pieces and I need three holes in the side of it, um, that's a lot to do with a small little whole bunch, right? So they have a drill um, that drills down through and actually cores out that hole for you. It's called drilling. So to drill the holes, there's a, a special machine for that. Uh, folding is um, a lot of work. So if you don't have a folding machine at the company, you got to get somebody to do that for you. There's a cost. Even if you have that folding machine at your company, the cost of standing having somebody stand there while it folds is a cost. Um, foil stamping is where you put that kind of gold leaf foil onto things and binding. You, I just showed you a picture of coil binding. Gluing to make pads at the end. What you actually do is you glue, put glue on the end. Um, numbering can be really extensive and expensive. Um, so if you have to number a bunch of tickets, uh, think about that. Sometimes there's companies that do that. Uh, they're all set up to do it. So you just, you're just cheaper to have them do it than you try to figure out how to do it. Um, perforating is where you put the little marks in so you fold it and you can rip it at that point um, like tickets right tickets have perforations in them um, but there's a cost to having that done so you got to think about all that at this point you may think I don't really have to know all this really what's he talking about like yeah, so he knows it like I don't need to know this right but if you want to get a job Right? So here, Niagara College, you come to work at Niagara College, you think, I don't have to know all this. But one day, uh, somebody says, hey, you need to go get that printed in the Rico Print Center at the college. And then you go down and they give you this piece of paper. They say, hey, yeah, just fill this out. Uh-oh, look at all that. You have to know what all that means. Or you got to stand there and ask them questions. I'm trying to teach it up front here. So look at that. There is collating, staple, drill, pad, fold, cut on the Niagara College printing. But you have to kind of understand what some of that means, right? Um, and they're more than willing to help, but it really does, um, it, it is helpful if you kind of understand what's going on, right? Um, so there's bond paper. NCR is um, non-carbon uh, non uh, reproduction paper, like repro paper. So it's like multiple layers. You write on the top one, it goes through all three. Um, and then, you know, all of this stuff. So you have to know all this stuff, okay? You didn't think you have to, but you kind of got to know it. All right, that's all about printing, and I hope it worked, um, and I uh, hope that works for you. And um, the good thing about this was you were able to stop and get a drink when you got bored. It was awesome. All right. Um, all right, I'm Paul Dayball from Niagara College, and uh, have a great day.